I'm glad to be back with you again. It's been a while since I preached here. I was actually supposed to preach this passage, Philippians 2, 8, 12 to 18, at first free this morning. But a week ago yesterday, Pastor Josh, you know him, uh, called me up and whispered, I have laryngitis and I can't preach. Would you preach for me? And so we decided we would preach our passages out of order. So I preached this passage last Sunday at First Free, and Josh is preaching what you got last Sunday, this Sunday at First Free. Well, Brandon had this emergency, and he heard that I had already preached this passage last Sunday. He said, would you come and do it again? So that's why I'm here today. Glad that you are a sister church of ours. We love Brandon and uh, love you all. And just happy to be here with you. In evangelical theology, two words are rarely put together, and that is work and salvation. They're put together by liberal theology, by Mormons, by Roman Catholics, but not by evangelicals. We automatically go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We put grace and salvation together, faith and salvation, gift and salvation, but not work and salvation. Because Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace you have been saved, by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. And of course, there are scores of other passages that make it clear to us that our salvation is something we receive not something that we earn. That's basic to our whole theology and our worldview. And that is why a phrase in our text today seems problematic and immediately raises questions in people's minds. In Philippians 2.12, Paul says, work out your salvation. Well, let me put you at ease. I don't think we need to be concerned about Paul's evangelical credentials. This is not only not heretical, it's actually thoroughly orthodox and eminently practical. Now, while my text is only verses 12 to 18, I can't read just that portion today because it begins with the word, therefore. You've never read a book that began with the word, therefore. You've never read a letter that begins with the word therefore. That wouldn't make any sense. Because therefore always connects what has just been said with what the writer is about to say. And so this morning we need to begin our reading with verse 5 so we can discover what the therefore is there for. Okay? Philippians 2, 5. Now I know Pastor... Brandon preached on this last week, but it won't hurt us to read it again, will it? Have this mind among yourselves. Please stand. I'm sorry. Have your mind. I'm glad you automatically do that. You know, that comes from the book of Nehemiah. The people all stood in reverence of God's word. We do that at first free, too. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked 
and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This, friends, is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, I'm sure that when Brandon preached on this amazing hymn about the person and work of Christ, he told you that this is not just great theology, although it is that. It is also very practical. Here in this hymn, he talks about the pre-existence of Christ, his deity, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation. But the whole purpose, ultimate purpose, of that hymn was to point to Jesus as an example of how we should live. He tells us that Jesus lived in humble, selfless, sacrificial service. And that is how we should behave. Then immediately after the hymn, we have this word, therefore, which says the same thing to us. It tells us that since Jesus exhibited humble, selfless, sacrificial service, therefore, we should do the same. Now, as I intimated earlier, there's little doubt that the one phrase in our text today that catches our attention is that one, work out your salvation. But please note with me, he doesn't tell you to work for your salvation or to work at your salvation or to work toward your salvation. He says to work out your salvation. You can't work something out unless it's already in, right? In fact, if you just look at the next phrase, that should put to rest any notion that Paul has gone over to the dark side. Because he says, work out your salvation for it is God who works in you. God is the initiator of our salvation. We are the responders. If God didn't love us first, none of us would love him at all. If God didn't seek us first, none of us would seek him. Now the the primary structure that I see in this passage here today is a command to work out your salvation with three incentives for doing so. There's, we should do it for the sake of God, for the sake of a lost and dying world, and for the sake of those who have invested in us spiritually. So let's look at the first one of those. We should work out our salvation in practical Christian living for the sake of and obedience to God. Notice how Paul approaches the Philippians here. It is with encouragement. His opening phrase is, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now. He not only affirms his deep love for them, but he also praises their past obedience in a positive way to encourage continuing obedience. People need encouragement. Children need encouragement. Adults need an encouragement. Employees need encouragement. Church members need encouragement. In fact, most people are far more motivated by encouragement than they are by criticism or rebuke. Now, Paul was not above rebuking people when they needed it, but he would much rather speak encouragement to their hearts. Further, he affirms that their obedience has not been selective. That is, they were not just obedient when he was with them, but also when he was absent. Think about it for a moment. The, the presence of Paul must have been a pretty strong incentive to obey. He was a strong leader. He was an apostle. He was a uh, fantastic theologian and a great pastor. But when he was a continent away and in prison to boot, maybe the incentive wouldn't be so strong to obey. You know the old saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play. But the Philippians haven't done that. 
and Paul praises them for it. He then uses their past obedience as a motive to continue to obey. And that brings us to this command itself, work out your salvation. I sat down and tried to think of other ways of stating the truth in that command. And I came up with these. Live out who you really are in Christ. Be sure that the transformation of your inner life is evident in your outward experience. Allow the gospel you profess to possess you fully. Don't treat your salvation as a mere fire escape from hell. Don't be satisfied with anything less than growth and progress in your Christian life. And especially, give attention to your relationships within the body of Christ. Now, I add that last point because throughout this book of Philippians, relationships seem to be uppermost in Paul's mind. His principal concern is how we live together in unity in the body of Christ. I'm so glad to hear that you're focusing on that here at the bridge. Let me try to demonstrate the emphasis from the book. In chapter 1, verse 27, Paul said, Let your manner of living be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's where Brandon and Josh and the other men in the preaching team came up with the title for this series, Gospel Worthy Living. Then in his subsequent exhortations, Paul speaks over and over the need for unity among believers. He speaks in verse 27 of one spirit, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he urges his prisoners to be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He goes on to say that they should look out not for their own interests, but for the interests of others. And even the hymn about Jesus talks about the fact that he rejected selfish individualism in his ministry to us. In chapter 4, Paul brings up two women who are having a nasty spat in the church, and he urges the church leaders to help these women reconcile and get along. So you see, all the way through the book, it's focusing on unity in the church for the sake of the gospel. That is principally how we are to work out our salvation. Notice, too, that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because this is serious business. Paul may not be here, but God is present, and we owe him the responsibility to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. You know, whenever we really love a person, we're not afraid of what that person can do to us. We're afraid of what we might do to that person. We don't want to wound their heart. Well, this fear and trembling that he talks about doesn't send us running away from God because we're afraid of being punished. It drives us to God because we know that we need his help and he is willing to help us. And we know that for good reason, because the text goes on to say it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now friends, living the Christian life is a daunting task. You know it and I know it. In fact, it's really an impossible task to live it by ourselves. But God is there to help us, both to will and to do the right thing. And we need both, don't we? There's sometimes when we don't want to do the right thing. We get discouraged, we get distracted, sometimes we just don't care. Most of the time, the believers I know, I'll speak for myself, I want to do the right thing. I just can't pull it off. But this passage tells us that God is there to help us want to do the right thing and then to go ahead and do it. Isn't that an amazing promise? That's what God tells us.
Well, so far we've seen that God himself is our first and highest incentive to work out our salvation in practical Christian living. But there's a second incentive we are given. And it says, do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We should work out our salvation in practical Christian living for the sake of a lost and depraved world in which we live. Let's start with Paul's description of the world that he lived in. He calls it a crooked and twisted generation. Any doubt that that's at least a little bit relevant to the day we live in? Most of you didn't live in the 1960s. I was in college, seminary, and graduate school through most of the 60s. I'll tell you, I thought the world was going to hell in a handbasket in the 60s, and I didn't think it could possibly get any worse. I was wrong. We had Vietnam protests where protesters were blowing up government buildings and taking over university administration buildings. We had uh, people who were what did he say, Tune, tuning in, uh, turning on, tuning in, and dropping out by the hundreds of thousands, taking drugs. and There was the free love approach with uh, abortion on demand. It was just an awful time, downright scary. But if anything, things have gotten worse. You know, I could not have imagined back in the 60s that not only abortion would be advocated by political leaders, but even infanticide and euthanasia, I couldn't have imagined that same-sex marriage would be legal across our country and people would be excoriated for just holding to the traditional view of marriage that has been true for thousands of years. We couldn't have imagined that marijuana would be legalized in half our states and that Candidates of both major political parties could live lives of blatant promiscuity without paying really any political price for it. We couldn't have imagined that major Christian denominations would be hiring openly gay clergy and celebrating divorce. Friends, we live in a crooked and twisted generation. And in that kind of society, God calls for his people to be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, so we can shine as lights in a dark, dark world. The three character traits that he mentions here are worth examining in detail. The first is blameless. That expresses what the Christian should be to the world. His life should be such that no one can find anything to undermine his witness. The second is innocent. That's what the Christian should be to himself. It means to have absolute integrity. The third, without blemish, describes what the Christian should be to God. It's a word that spoke of uh, the sacrifices that people would bring to the altar. And, and the purity of the Christian's life should be such that it will stand even the scrutiny of God. The person I think of when I read words like blameless, innocent, and without blemish is Daniel. You remember the story of how the government officials under King Darius tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so? They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said to themselves, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. In other words, they had to use religious bigotry in order to get to Daniel. Now you stop and think for a moment. How would you fare if someone read all your letters and all your documents, 
wiretapped all your phone calls, checked all of your internet sites, followed you everywhere you went, interviewed all of your family members and all of your acquaintances, would you survive that kind of scrutiny? Daniel did. He really did. Now, is Paul calling for perfection? I don't think so. But he is calling for something beyond the ordinary. He's calling for Christians to stand out and be different. I was studying the book of Nehemiah recently, and I found an interesting statement in Nehemiah 7.2, where it says Nehemiah appointed a man named Hanani to be the ruler over Jerusalem because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. I like that. That's quite an epitaph. A man of integrity who feared God more than most people do. I think that's what God is calling for here. But isn't it interesting that he introduces these expectations with a rather unexpected command? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Is that the main thing that enables us to be people who are blameless and innocent in God's sight? Well, I don't know if it's the main thing, but it's certainly an important thing, especially when it comes to unity in the body of Christ. For you see, people don't usually grumble and dispute with themselves. They do it with other people. And Paul says, stop it. I can't help but believe he must have had the Israelites in mind when he spoke of grumbling. They were professional grumblers. They grumbled because they were in Egypt. They grumbled when they left Egypt because they weren't in Egypt any longer. They grumbled because they didn't have food. So God gave them supernatural food from heaven. And then they grumbled because it wasn't meat. They grumbled because they weren't in the promised land. And when they get, got to the promised land, they grumbled because they were in the promised land. They just grumbled all the time. Now, we don't do that, do we? What do we grumble about? Just about everything. Think about just this morning. Did you grumble about the time change? <laughs> we grumble about the weather. We grumble about the driver that's too slow in front of us as we're coming to church. We grumble because of how far we have to walk into the sanctuary. We grumble about how people are dressed. We grumble about the long prayers. We grumble about the music. And that's all before the preacher starts meddling. <laughs> We are professional grumblers. And what about disputing? What do we dispute about? Just about everything. We love to argue about fine points of doctrine that don't make a hill of beans difference. I doubt if this happens at your church, but we have, in the last two years, lost several families over the age of the earth, over baptism, how you do baptism, over the rapture, the time of the rapture. Friends, these don't make any difference about your salvation or your walk with Christ. And yet we dispute these things. We dispute the decisions that our leaders make. We dispute over the way they spend our money that we give. Um, and who knows what else. Now, Paul isn't saying we should never express ourselves in the church, that we should never offer suggestions. Um, believe me, constructive criticism is needed in the church. The body of Christ needs to come together and share our wisdom. But that's very different from a complaining spirit, an argumentative spirit, a divisive spirit. Paul says those things should not be part of our lives. And this command to do all things without grumbling or disputing, it's as much a command of Scripture as is, thou shalt have no other gods before me, or thou shalt not commit adultery, or thou shalt not bear false witness. This is God's word to us.
And why is this important? Because in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, we need to shine as lights in the world. You know, some Christians have opted out of that responsibility. The monastery movement took supposedly highly spiritual people and put them, separated them from the world. There was one guy named Simon Stylides who back in 456, I think it was, decided he would start living on a pole. So he got up 50 feet in the air on a little platform about a yard square and he sat up there so he wouldn't be contaminated by the world. He stayed up there for 36 years. They hauled his food up by a rope and a pulley, and he was considered a saint. Friends, that's not God's way. That's not his way. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. He has put us here as lights in the world. And you know something about light? Light shines brighter when the surroundings are the darkest. I had an amazing experience about five years ago. I got to go on a raft trip through the Grand Canyon, eight days. And uh, at night, we would camp out on a sandbar a mile deep in the Grand Canyon. And you know the most amazing thing about that was nighttime. When the sun went down and there was no artificial light from any artificial source, those stars shined unbelievably brilliant. God has put us in a dark, dark world. He has put us here to shine. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. We all know that. But he has appointed us to be little lights in the world, in the darkness. We need, we need to live in such a way that a broken world will sit up and take notice that God is doing something supernatural in our midst. And friends, they'll never see that if we are grumbling and disputing and arguing with one another. Jesus was speaking of us when he prayed in John 17. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. That's the only way the world's going to know if they see us living in love to one, one another. The text goes on to say, you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life or holding out the word of life. The Bible is God's lantern. You remember from the psalmist said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the lantern that we hold out to a lost world so that they can find the way. Well, so far we have seen that we should work out our salvation in practical Christian living for the sake of God, for the sake of a lost world, the third and last thing is we should do it for the sake of those who have invested in us spiritually. Look at verse 15. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul is speaking here as their pastor, as the one who introduced them to Christ, taught them the Christian faith, encouraged them in the gospel. And he exhorts them to live productive, unified lives so that he won't have to face Jesus empty-handed. He wants to have some trophies to lay at Jesus' feet. Now, is that selfish? I don't think so. Everyone who has been involved in ministry, whether as a professional or as a layperson, has at times wondered whether his efforts were worth all the trouble all the heartache, all the effort. As God measures success, what have we really accomplished? I wonder that at times. It's a biblical concern. It was Moses in Psalm 90 who prayed, establish the work of our hands, Lord. Establish the work of our hands. What Moses was sharing is something that's in everyone's heart. I want to make a difference. 
I want to leave a mark. And Paul is confident that when Jesus comes, he will be able to say, my work has been worth it if they work out their salvation and in, in practical Christian living and unity in the body of Christ. Now, how do we apply this incentive? Every one of us who knows Christ in a saving way owes a debt of gratitude to someone else, probably many other people. Maybe a parent who led you to Christ, maybe a friend, maybe a coworker, maybe a pastor. You, you have someone in your life. It's the reason you're here this morning, the reason you believe. And we don't want to disappoint those people. They have poured out their hearts in our lives. So it should be an added incentive to us to continue in obedience, to continue to work out our salvation, especially in demonstrating unity with other believers. In fact, this morning, I want to ask you to do something very practical. I want to ask you to write a note to someone that you owe a debt of gratitude to for their spiritual investment in your life. Someone recently did this for me. In December, I received a letter from a lady I know only by name. Uh, she was a member at First Free back in 1979 when I was pastoring. That's 40 years ago. And then I left in 1984, and I've not seen this woman since. But she wrote me a letter, and I want to read a portion of it. She said, Dear Pastor Mike, the reason I am writing is because of a recent conversation I had with George and Marjean Fouché. They're a couple in their 90s in our church. I mentioned to them that there were two of your sermons that struck me, have struck me throughout the years. George suggested that I write you and thank you for those sermons. He said you would probably be glad to receive my letter and it would be an encouragement to you. The first sermon series that was significant to me was the one you did on the book of Job. This was 1980, friends. I recall that you stressed that everything that happens to us goes through the hand of God. Not long after the conclusion of that series, I faced a horrific incident in my life. My father was living with me and my husband. One evening following our evening meal, I heard a strange noise coming from his room, and I went to check it out. The door to his bedroom was ajar, and I peeked in. What I saw was something I hope no one else ever has to see. My father had a 45 automatic gun pointing at his head. I yelled, Daddy, no, as I ran toward him to try to knock the gun out of his hand. I was too late. And I'll skip the next couple of sentences because they're pretty gory. She goes on to say, almost immediately, one phrase kept going through my mind. Everything goes through the hand of God. Those words sustained me for a long time, and I will never forget them. She then mentions a second sermon that I preached. And finally, she concludes, I told George that you might be offended that I only recall two of your sermons specifically. He told me that you would probably be glad that I remembered even two. I do thank you for all the years you faithfully preached God's word. Friends, George was right. I was very encouraged that she wrote and that she remembered even two sermons. I read that to you today, not to encourage you to say anything to me or even to Pastor Brandon, but to think of someone who needs a word of encouragement like that from you. And I would encourage you to do it today or in the next few days. Tell them how much their ministry has meant to you. Well, today we have learned that work and salvation are not antithetical to one another. We're not asked to work at our salvation or for our salvation or toward our salvation. But we are asked to work out the salvation that God has worked into us. Are there attitudes 
you have exhibited toward one another or toward your pastors or the elders or anyone else in the church that are ungodly and detrimental to the unity of the body of Christ? Have you been a complainer, an arguer, a disputer, And is there a way you can channel your ideas into constructive criticism instead? Can you find ways to encourage your fellow believer rather than to discourage them? For the sake of God, for the sake of a lost and broken world in which we live, and for the sake of those who have invested in your life spiritually, I urge you today to work out your salvation. Let's pray.